Welcome to Sacred Realms. Huh? It's a great day in Hyrule, y'all. Welcome to Sacred Realms, a Zelda retrospective podcast uh, for the third time in season six, uh, covering the original Legend of Zelda. I am your host, Lyndon Willoughby, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, my sibling, the person who occupies a room in my home and in my heart. Aww. That'd be Matt. Which which room in your heart? Is it one of the ventricles or... uh is it the, the atrio? Uh, whichever one you can get for 700 bucks a month. <laughs> <laughs> At least you get a room. I get a cupboard under the stairs like yeah, Harry Potter. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and you barely even fit in it. You got to like scrunch up real small like Samus and her Metroid <laughs> so ball. So mistreated. You are. Nobody loves you. Matt has his room and then a room for all his crap. And then you get the cupboard under the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> what a Dudley that Matt. <laughs> that was a Dudley move. <laughs> well, now seems Dude, like I don't think we've ever done Harry Potter on this podcast before. <laughs> we have not. Which I is, think that's the first. Have you gotten to the cap? Captain Potter episode of uh, um, of uh, yeah. Greatest oh, Generation. Oh yes, I have. With the I want to go see the captain now. I want to see my father. <laughs> what is that? Oh my god, it's so amazing. Okay, so brief tangent uh and our marin open as they call it so linda and i both listen to this amazing star trek podcast called greatest generation where they are it's a comedy podcast explicit so you know if kids are listening or whatever we the whole don't. the whole shtick is that they just make fun of star trek uh, yeah and the so they go episode by episode in next generation was their first se- uh, series they did and they go episode by episode and there's an episode in the next generation season six called rascals where where some of the crew get in a transporter accident and get turned into kids. It's not a good episode. It's terrible. (laughs) And Captain Picard is one of these people, and he becomes a British child, and he is so freaking obnoxious. And they make so much fun of him, and they have a habit of doing really terrible impressions and they're both um, American guys and they're doing this British accent as a child and every time they do it they play the Harry Potter theme behind it <laughs> <laughs> they're just amazing. making fun it's so funny the crossover we didn't know we needed mm. I hope one day to have a podcast as successful as uh, those guys do. Regardless, we did not come here to talk about anybody else's podcast or even about Star Trek, although that always tends to happen. Or Harry Potter. What we are here to do is talk about Zelda, and uh, if you hadn't already put two and two together, we brought uh, we brought a friend along to help us do that tonight. He's a recurring guest. You know him, you love him. He is the detective, Mike. How you doing, Mike? He's the third in our threesome, the third part of our Triforce. Thank you. <laughs> you can edit that threesome yeah. joke out, no. out if you want, but I, I, I like kind of stand by it. <laughs> I kind of stand by it. No, I'll allow it. Okay, fair enough. Yep. Yeah. Shall we gingerly touch our tips? <laughs> <laughs> Might edit that out. <laughs> yeah, I think you should edit that one out. That was upsetting. <laughs> Mike, how have you been doing? We are, we are, of course, great, uh, greatly honored to have you back on the show uh, for uh, the first episode of a new game. I'm super excited to be here, and I've never played this game before, so I'm uh, I'm wading my way through it. Nobody has. I don't think anybody has played this game before. Like, this entire season is just us and people who have never played this game a single time in their lives. So I guarantee you someone has played this game I before. Mean, I, know for, I, was gonna say, I know for a fact. <laughs> they made a least, second one. <laughs> there's at least a few people that have played that we know and will be guesting on this show in the future. I would say the guy who wrote the guide that we've been referencing and had on this show to talk about making a guide for this game has probably played this game. So Phil Summers at least has played this game front to back. And like Cody and Josh. Who are they? Ah, Lyndon. You can't say that about our partners at Zelda Universe, Lyndon. <laughs> we love Cody and Josh. No, I know other people have played this game, but I just think it is it is really fun that we um, so far have kind of managed to go, uh, you know, kind of batting a thousand on people who have basically no familiarity with this game whatsoever, all playing it for the first time. So, I, you know, we'll definitely have some people on before the end of the season who have got more historical knowledge of this game, but it just has not panned out that way so far. You realize you said that about our second episode with a guest, <coughs> and 
the first guest we had had played it. So we're not batting a thousand. We're batting 500 at the moment. Yeah, but that was a bo- So Phil's was a bonus episode. Okay. So we're batting a thousand out of one. Well, yeah, but a hundred percent success ratio in a, in a sample size. Sure. Of one. But yes, but Max is coming on next week and uh, he has not played this game. He has played it, but has not beaten it. Well, uh, okay. Mm. Okay. I'm just trying to poke holes in your boat, Lyndon. Yeah, right. It's not a sports Stop podcast. Stop blowing holes in my ship. <laughs> Speaking of Americans <laughs> trying to do terrible English accents, um, as, as, Matt, as Matt impersonates an American doing an English accent, <laughs> he was much better at it than I was. That's like accent inception right there. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, how have you been doing, man? I've been fantastic, bro. Um, getting ready for a move. We're moving down to your new neck of the woods um, just to be closer to you. Um, and it's closer to the work. So we're excited about that. Kiddos are are moving and grooving. My daughter's going to pre-K from Ooh, preschool. So, mm. you know, big graduation. Had a luau party at the daycare today. That's fun. Um, luau. Ooh. <laughs> I was the only one that wore anything remotely Hawaiian. Well, that's just boring. I know. Every, lame. Bunch of lame folks. Did they, they roast a pig over an open fire at, no. the, at the pre-K luau? When I asked the staff if I could bring a pig and roast it on their grounds and put an apple in its mouth, I got some really weird looks. Well, that's just, again, lame. <laughs> These people have never been to a luau, clearly. No, I, I, I dare say they have not. Okay, cool. We are happy that you have fun and exciting things happening in your life right now. Um, of course, we are always just honored to have you back on the show. The conversation is always great. And uh, I know I specifically am excited to get back into talking about the game that we uh, showed up this season to play after a short uh, hiatus last week where we had a bonus episode. How about you, Matt? Are you excited to kind of get back on get back on track here? I know that we had a great conversation with Phil last week, but I don't know. I'm ready to talk about some game. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as I sneeze my guts out. Um, yes, <clears throat> I am very excited to have uh, another conversation here. We played a good chunk. We had a good time. There were some laughs, uh, not quite as many as we just had, of which nobody will hear because uh, we have a wonderful uh, audio editor. Yeah, I, I just, I just, I'm going to have to slice about three and a half minutes of very raunchy humor out of this episode, <laughs> and you will never hear it, listeners. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Well, it's, that's not the pod you're here for. My but bad, maybe it's guys. the pod you want. My bad. We don't know. That, that might be a secret tear <laughs> down the road. <laughs> Um, no, it's, it's been, uh, it's been a fun journey and I'm glad to, and excited to sit down and talk about it. Absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and get into the housekeeping real quick and then dive right into it because this is the first episode I'm realizing where we actually have like a combo of dungeons to talk about. And I'm curious to, to, to the, like the extent that that actually makes the dungeon map a longer section of episode. Like, I don't know if these dungeons are big enough to where it'll just end up being like pretty regular length or what the deal is, but I imagine it'll be a fairly regular dungeon, uh, length episode from, I don't know, one of our other seasons because they're both pretty short. And, uh, as we'll get into, you can very accidentally beat them immediately. (laughs) We'll uh, we'll definitely talk about that just a little bit. But before we do that, let's get into some housekeeping. If you didn't know, Sacred Realms is a weekly re-examination of The Legend of Zelda one little slice at a time. Sacred Realms drops every Wednesday and is available on all major podcast networks. Every week we play a new section of a Zelda game, and then we sit down here to talk and to drop our hot takes. If that sounds fun to you, please head over to Apple Podcasts, hit that subscribe button, be sure to leave us a review. Five-star reviews are greatly appreciated, and they have a chance to get a shout-out here on the show. If you want more Sacred Realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash sacredrealmspod to get access to our Discord channel, listener mail, vote on what game we play next, and much more. Additionally, one of the benefits that all Master Sword patrons and above get on our Patreon is that they get their names read every week here on the show. Those legendary individuals are Mike, Dylan, Ali, Lennon, Leviticus, Kolku, Rowan, Josh, Nick, Keep It Going Pod, Dante, Gip, Mary, Brittany, Davey, Haru the Mighty, Derek, Albert, Mark, Andy, Cameron, Tyler, Ben, Daniel, Nick D underscore TV, Travis, Christian, Jonathan, Hyrule Interviews, a.k.a. Maximilian Nichols. I don't think his first name's actually Maximilian. I hope it is. I, I actually feel like I need to ask him now. I don't know. I'm curious. I, so vote. Is it Maximilian or Maxwell? Are there any other or options? Maximus. 
Maximus, Maximus Nichols. Nichols. That's the one I'm going for. God, I hope that's what it is. <laughs> Garrett and Drew, we could not make this podcast without your generous support. We have uh, especially enjoyed getting to know all of you just a little bit better in our Discord channel over the last few weeks. You are legendary individuals, and we appreciate you very much. I do want to drop one more reminder before we get into the Sacred Realms rundown, and that is that as of uh, episode one of this season, all of our new episodes drop day and date on the Zelda Universe YouTube channel. We appreciate our partners at Zelda Universe so much. Um, if you are the kind of person who prefers to consume your podcasts in a YouTube window instead of in a podcast app, then that option is now there for you. So uh, go uh, go hit it up and uh, be sure to drop them a subscribe as well because they have lots of other great content that they uh, that they post on that channel pretty regularly. So I think that's all we got, Matt. Does that sound right? Did I miss anything? Uh, no, I think we're, we're good to go. I do want to give one shout out though, to all of our wonderful listeners, uh, this past week, with the assistance and uh, partnership of our friends at Zelda Universe, we officially, for the first time ever, reached over 1,000 people in a calendar week with our last episode. So thank you, all of you who tuned in and listened, whether that be on your podcasts or on the YouTube channel. Uh, we appreciate you guys so much. That's a huge milestone for us and one that, honestly, Lyndon and I didn't think we would re ever really get to. Um, but thank you guys so much for the continued support, and uh, you guys have really surpassed all of our expectations so thank you so much dang guys that's exciting i'm so proud of you got those quad digits now feels good whoop yeah um i mean yeah i look uh this has all definitely come quite a long way since we started and we have a community that we really love um it uh you know what we're we're not uh we're not banking like kind of funny numbers or anything like that but uh but we wouldn't trade our community for anything. It's a great group, and uh, we love making content for y'all. So I think we're probably just going to keep doing it. I mean— I think that's kind of the plan. What if we announced right here and right now that we that were, we're just like done? We're, done. we're yeah. just like cutting it off? Yep. I think we'd have a very small riot on our hands. A very, very— or at least a <laughs> 1,000 people. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> not a small riot, <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're very spread out. So, you know, maybe yeah, it good would point. be uh, dis dispersed. Y'all are stuck with us for years— I hope you. Uh, I hope you're looking forward to uh, what did we say at the last count? Thirteen seasons of uh, Zelda I content. Don't know. Um, hold on, at least <laughs> buckle up, buckle. And then maybe maybe we just start it all over again at the beginning afterwards. <laughs> well, seasons are hard because we're like some seasons are combining games, but it's sixteen games total that I have on my list right now. So well, that's a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Woo. So <laughs> there you go. Plenty of ground left to cover. Well, let's get to covering it. Uh, without further ado, we do that, of course, every week in the Sacred Realms Rundown, which is a six-part analysis of what we played this week and the feelings that it made us feel. Uh, this week, we are covering The Legend of Zelda Chapter 2 uh, with two dungeons, Moon and Manji. Uh, of course, part one of the Sacred Realms Rundown is always the plot recap this week, read again by Matt. You ready for a little plot recap, Matt? After conquering the first dungeon and claiming the first piece of the broken Triforce of Wisdom, we find ourselves back in the foothills of Death Mountain, with no clues on where to head next. But despite this, we start to head east, and along the way, find or purchase some new items to help us along our quest. With a candle we purchased from a merchant in a cave nearby, we are able to burn some foliage and, of course, monsters. Using this fun new trick, we discover a secret passage in a tree near the first dungeon, and inside is a new heart container that increases our life force. Similarly, with some handy bombs we took off the corpse of a blue moblin, we were able to blow some holes in some other rock faces around the area. We head south and blow a hole in a wall and find another heart container and another hole in a wall, a gambling game. With our wallet brimming with rupees from our gambling addiction, we continue heading along the coast of a lake in the southeastern region of the foothills. Along the way, we find another merchant who is selling some arrows to go along with the bow that we got in the first dungeon. So we eagerly pay the man some money and take our new long-range weapon of destruction with us. We use our new tools to explore the eastern area of the foothills, where we finally come across the second dungeon. In this dungeon, which is shaped like a crescent moon, we fight some new enemies like the rope-like snakes, the deadly moldorm, and a trio of Goria guarding an upgraded magical boomerang. 
but most fearsome of all these enemies is the King Dodongo that guards the final room of the chamber. But with the help of our most explosive items, aka bombs, we make short work of the dinosaur-esque enemy, taking a few hits here and there along the way. In the final room, we find our second piece of the broken Triforce, which restores us to full health. So without further ado, we head off to find the third dungeon. En route to our next adventure, we find some more items and people who can further help us along our way. Another piece of heart is found in a cave, uncovered by our destructive habits. An old man gives us the recipe for a life-restoring potion, which we have to take to an old woman elsewhere on the map. And we even go so far as to climb around into the hillside of Death Mountain itself. Here we find some truly fearsome enemies, like the Lionel whose devastating attacks tear through our shield and deplete massive amounts of health. But once we fell one of these beasts that is guarding a cave near a mountain lake, we head into this cave to find another old man with a new sword for us to use. This sword is double the power of our wooden sword and glows with a white power. Weary from our fight with so many foes, we luckily stumble upon a glade with a peaceful pond where a fairy lives and this fairy graciously heals our wounds and sends us on our way. Along this way, we also come across some truly cowardly moblins who beg for their life and bribe us with rupees instead of fighting. Grateful for the chance to avoid a fight and gain some profit in the process, we take their money and promise to keep their secret from their fellows. We continue to head west and south in search of the third dungeon, which we find after crossing a bridge in the southern part of the map. Here we find a dungeon shaped like a plus sign with some branches on each end. And Certainly not a problematic looking shape at all. <clears throat> no, we, we will not discuss anything of that sort at all. This shape encourages us to explore all avenues of the map to find every item that we can. In the westmost branch, we find a raft, which we can use to cross the rivers and lakes of Hyrule. In the northmost branch, we find an old man who asks if we found the sword guarded by the waterfall, referring to our handy new white blade. All throughout the dungeon, there are new and extremely dangerous enemies called Dark Nuts, which are fully armored and carry massive shields to protect them from any damage from the front. Fortunately, a bomb can go right through their defenses, or a quick strike from behind does the trick as well. Also, some nasty fireball enemies, which we dub Bubbles, which paralyze our ability to use offensive weapons. In the eastmost branch, we find the boss, Manhandala, which I think is a hilarious Its name. Its name is Manhandala? Yes, I'm 100% serious. Manhandala. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 100, 100 yeah. Is a gigantic four-headed beast that flies around the room with blinding speed. Matt, did you get manhandled by Manhandala? I did not. He'll manhandle you. I know he will. He wanted to. He tried to. Did not succeed. <laughs> A gigantic four-headed beast that flies around the room with blinding speed. Its four heads are, are all armed with razor-sharp teeth and armor plating. It lands some pretty nasty blows and takes off lots of hearts as we fight to the death with this beast of evil. With some well-placed bombs and some swings of our new sword, we cut off each of the four heads and bring the monster down. We proceed into the final room of the dungeon and claim the third piece of the broken Triforce for ourselves. Our sights are set for the next dungeon, and with our new items, we have even more opportunity to explore the land of Hyrule around us to increase our power as we prepare to fight the evil Ganon. This has been the plot recap as read. This brings us into part two of the Sacred Realms Rundown, which is our takes, where we talk about this section of the game and how it made us feel, um, as is the polite thing to do. I'm going to go ahead and uh, refer things first to our guest for the evening. And before you talk about this particular section of the game and how, what you think of it, Mike, I'm curious to get your thoughts on what your experience has been like with The Legend of Zelda overall so far, because uh, I think we're all going to have... Um, you know, some slightly nuanced takes on, on this having, you know, all of us playing it for the first time and, you know, it being a game that kind of predates all of us, you know, we, we all are gamers of a generation just right after this. So, yeah. And man, do I have takes. Um, so I jumped into this game uh, a week ago ish after you asked me if I wanted to be on for this episode, I was kind of falling behind with all the moving stuff. 
Um, so you told me before going in that such beautiful things as the illustrated guide existed. Uh, thank you, Phil. And so I knew that it existed and me being kind of stubborn, I wanted to see how I would do with the game, just jumping into it cold. I mean, no, no guide, just let's go. And I did go ahead and let the, the start menu spool through so I could see the, the overall kind of start. Uh, it's easy to miss though, if you didn't know it was there. Yeah, but it contains the entire backstory of the game. Yeah, so I imagine like the poor sod who just is like super eager. He got this game on, uh, I don't know when the, in the year the game came out, but imagine like Christmas morning when I got Ocarina of Time, jumping in, you just want to play, you hit start. Cool, I'm in a clearing with no context and no idea what I'm supposed to do. Um, so I did have the context, but I jumped in and I immediately went right. I said, F that cave. <laughs> <laughs> and so I kept going and I had nothing. There's nothing important in there. No, why would they throw a cave in that perfectly clearing? Um, so I, I started out, didn't have anything on me, very quickly learned that that was the wrong thing to do, went back, got my sword, and then I just kind of wandered aimlessly for about 30 minutes and decided that was not the way to play this game. <laughs> I ended up in like dungeon four and I ended up, I, I did go and find the, uh, the gambling game, which I didn't know about the rewind function. So I, on my very first go, I think I got 50 rupees Ooh. and I'm like, oh, heck yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. Buy me in. Let's let's do this. You're a lucky man. You should go buy a lotto ticket. Well, that's what I thought. So I went back and did it again. I immediately lost 40 of those rupees. <laughs> <laughs> I said, lightning can't strike twice. Let me try it again. Then I lost 20 more. And then I decided that was a bad idea. Then I listened to the episode and found out the rewind function worked. I might have used that to my advantage a little bit. Well, I mean, as you should. <laughs> I feel a little dirty uh, every time I do that, but also... I don't know. I'm just like, I'm, I'm okay sacrificing my morals for the sake of like <laughs> financial gain in a video game. I'm glad to know where the line is now, Lyndon. And I'm also glad you <laughs> clarified that in a video in game. In a video game. In there, yeah. <laughs> well, no, but imagine if you could take that skill to Vegas and just like tap your shoulders. Uh, oh, okay, that hand to blackjack didn't happen. <laughs> 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 I, uh, I would have an entirely different uh, financial situation. <laughs> but uh, So anyway, I did that for a while, kind of wandered aimlessly. I just can't do that in this game. I, I felt like I was kind of hitting my head against the wall, didn't know where to go. There's almost zero signposting. So then I broke out the game guide and got to dungeon one. Um, is that supposed to be the great Deku tree? Uh, you know, I was actually, I was wondering about that. Uh, obviously this game was created well in advance of the great Deku tree being a thing, but uh, I don't know. It is a, it is a dead cleared out stump um, surrounded by trees. And I will say that uh, Phil's guide, the illustration that he has of it, uh, it's got sort of like dead Deku tree, look to it so which would be really sad head head canon is that this is the um this is the long dormant uh body of the deku tree from ocarina of time calling it now oh i mean yeah i'm i'm here for that i mean that's kind of think of where i got it is watching the looking at the game guide and seeing that kind of corpse of a tree um but so I, from there, not to go back over the first episode y'all had, but um, then I kind of tried to use the game guide sparingly uh, so that I wasn't getting too much uh, of a lead, but it was very helpful to kind of see what path I was supposed to take. And I liked that he, he kind of broke it down into the, okay, well, here's how to get to the next dungeon and maybe some things along the way you want to keep an eye out for. Um, so I enjoyed that. Um, and so then getting into the takes on dungeon two, the moon um, I really like the way the dungeon is set up, and I think Matt... Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We have a dungeon map for that. So forget, forget about the dungeon. I, I don't even know what you're talking about. I didn't go to a dungeon. Um, but so as far as the, the overworld there, um, I did find some some fun kind of, I guess, which we'll eventually get to a booby trails. Um, but I had a, a really good time getting into the game. With the guide, I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. Without the guide... Um, I probably would have played like a day on this and decided I had better things to do. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think that that's probably where Matt and I would have landed with it as well. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. You know, uh, Ben and Pat, I actually, I don't know if it was Ben or Pat who sent us this message. Uh, one of the brothers over at Hyrule Podcasters um, sent us a message and uh, on Twitter, I believe. And uh, I think this is Ben who always does this. Anyway, uh, he, he is prone to listening to our show uh, while he's out for a run and then sending us some observations, um, which is, uh, I think it's a good little ritual to get into. I appreciate that he does that. So anyway, he was letting us know that um, he really recommended trying to get into this game and do it without the assistance of the guide to kind of preserve a lot of the exploratory nature of it. And I don't know, I think where I landed with that was that I truly like, I very much respect that opinion. And I think for a certain type of gamer, that approach would really appeal to them. Like if you enjoy exploration, pure and simple, just for the sake of doing it, then I think that, yes, that would probably be the, the best way to tackle it. My issue is that I, I I enjoy the exploration factor of a Zelda game very much, like the problem solving and the trial and error of going to a place, and that's not where I need to be, so I need to go to another place. Uh, my thing is that I, I need some structure around that, you know? Um, I mean, even Breath of the Wild, for as open-ended as it is, has some structure, right? Like, even though you can kind of tackle that game in whatever order you really want to, you still sort of know the major areas that you're supposed to be kind of like vectoring towards, you know? And um, I don't know. I just don't think that like, I don't think that it would be fun for me spending a lot of time just like stumbling around this entire map until I happen to land in the dungeon that I know I'm supposed to be in next, right? Like, um, that that just does not sound like enjoyable time spent to me, especially given the fact that the only thing kind of like padding out that experience, if that's how you choose to do it, is just like engaging in, in combat with like trash ads. Well, and map. also like it's so easy to stumble into the wrong dungeon. I stumbled into dungeon nine at least uh, at least dungeon nine. I think I stumbled into probably at least one other one, maybe seven uh, while I was going between dungeons two and three. And uh, because like you said, I was mostly trying to see if I could possibly find something of interest without using the guide. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't trying necessarily to find the, uh, the next dungeon. I was just seeing if I could find something interesting and I did. And it happened to be the last dungeon in the game besides death well, mountain. <laughs> yeah. You'll stumble into things. And so I don't know, I haven't played enough of this game yet to know if like, Hey, can you go ahead and beat dungeon four without beating dungeons one, two, and three. But I have to think at some point there's some lack of items that you would need or something. One thing different about this game I've noticed versus the other Zeldas I've played is that there's almost nothing needed to get in to each dungeon. Um, later in Zelda, most of the time, I feel like they implement you need a certain item or a certain thing to get into each dungeon. Here, it's all just, okay, you can wander in. I mean, there's there's no, you need this to get in here, um, which kind of makes it confusing. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely does. And I do think, I think that there is a version of like a second playthrough that I would want to do for this game at some point, which is to go, you know, months or a year or however long down the road, go into this game and commit myself to not reading from a guide at all, and just see what I can remember from memory, it probably would not be uh, as detailed as like, oh, I remember that Dungeon 3 is here and 4 is here and whatnot. Like, I would be curious to know, you know, just what my experience would be like if I committed myself to like, okay, if I stumble into a dungeon, I'm going to go try and beat that dungeon on the first go. And I will say that of the three that we've played so far, I can't think of any mechanics that would keep you from beating the dungeon were you to just stumble into it with three hearts and your wooden sword. I'm sure it would be more difficult, but... Yeah, I think the difficulty would be the main thing because it seems yeah. to me like you get the item to beat the dungeon within the dungeon itself. Um, so... At least for like the raft, like. Uh, but you don't need the raft but, to beat the. But dungeon. you need to get to another dungeon. I, I meant more. Uh, am I skipping ahead here with the ladder? You uh, are. Yes, yes. you are. Before. Forget the ladder. It doesn't exist. <laughs> the ladder does uh, not but, exist. I mean, so things there like that. There is no ladder. In yeah, Boston, I, I might have played a little bit ahead just to try and uh, catch up with you guys. But um, so I mean, there, there's things within the dungeons that you might need to use to beat it. Um, but that's not always the case. Another question that might be a dumb question, but I have it all the same: is Are there any villages in this game? No. No. So I found that very different than most of the Zeldas I've played as well, too. There's usually at least some sort of population center that makes it feel like a... A place with people? Yes, uh, like a, a land, if you will. So kind of what I'm headcanoning... A kingdom. Yeah, kingdom. I'm kind of taking that this is like 
a very far outskirt of the kingdom. We've actually gotten confirmation on this. We mentioned it briefly in uh, in chapter one, but uh, it was brought up to us by Josh from Zelda Universe in the Discord channel uh, that our our assumption was correct, and it has been confirmed that this entire game takes place in the foothills of Death Mountain. Um, geographically speaking like this is not meant to be representative of the entire kingdom of hyrule yeah and i also want to correct myself i didn't stumble into dungeon nine it was dungeon eight dungeon nine is death mountain the last dungeon i stumbled into dungeon eight but um no i think you're totally right mike that like it's it's a different kind of experience and obviously most of that due to the limitations of the system that it was built right right? and i I believe that's probably true it'd be a lot harder to program in a city at this point um and all the different sprites that it requires but it's just kind of weird. You run into a bunch of hermits living up here. Yeah, a bunch of old men in the hills. And so did they like play paper, rock, scissors to be who was the hermit with the wooden sword versus the magical sword? Like no one wants to be wooden sword hermit. <laughs> or or a uh, note giving hermit with nothing else. He yeah. just gives you a recipe for a potion and says, go find the so old woman. When did old man letter hermit start his career as letter hermit like did he come out here in his 20s like i'm gonna hold this letter for as long as it takes and then now he's like 87 he's like finally it's been 87 years well the only the only person with a worse job than that is the old potion woman who has to sit in a cave and remain totally silent unless you bring the exact specific letter like she can't even tell you oh i need like i need need a recipe a recipe for this potion like she just gives you the straight silent treatment nothing at all yeah it was pretty unnerving oh maybe she's one of those uh the sheikah from breath of the wild that sits there in their like little catatonic sleep until you come in and do your stuff i mean you've got to be right otherwise they don't be dead <laughs> i mean maybe there's good eating in that cave there's gotta be some there's bugs. gotta be some worms or something they yeah. can she says she says go and bring peace to hyrule ah uh, yeah yeah. <laughs> so. yeah no i mean it's definitely a whole different kind of game this is like I, I mean, it's very clearly the the prototype for the Zelda formula, right? Um, and when you take it as a prototype, I think that it kind of actually exists in, uh, you know, a satisfying enough state, right? Like, I mean, is it fair to say that all of these weird quirks aside, you are having fun playing this game? Oh, very fair to say. I'm having a good time playing this game, and I honestly want to play it more. I'm trying not to get too far ahead um, so that things are still fresh, if you guys have me on for another episode. Um, <laughs> but We gonsta. Gonsta. Well, you know you um, have to be on the final one always. You're the third member of our voting party. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I better keep up. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's not... D- detracting from my enjoyment of the game at all. I'm just seeing all these things and kind of processing them um, and thinking about the differences. And then I'm also trying to keep in mind the product of its time and how things have progressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, talking about this section of the game a little bit more generally, I one thing that I really did like about this is that geographically speaking, we're kind of hitting um, lots of different areas of the map right now. Uh, Our first dungeon was in the dead center, basically. Um, Dungeon number two is in the east and dungeon number three is in the west. There's kind of a lot of stuff that you can kind of like stumble across uh, as you're kind of going from one to the next. Um, And that's even aside from the stuff that you wouldn't know is there, right? Like... (laughs) Like, bombable walls and trees that you can burn and stuff. I mean, all of those things, I'm I'm basically being informed that they exist by the guide because I simply do not have time to bomb every stretch of wall and try to light every tree on fire. Imagine your your eight-year-old self jumping into this game. You're so excited. And then you spend the entire Saturday morning you have to just burn trees with zero reward. Yeah, that would be more than frustrating to I me think personally. I think even eight-year-old me probably would have been done with that pretty quickly. Oh, uh, I probably would have stuck with it just because I was a dummy. Uh, but no, I, and I did that a little bit now. Um, so kind of referring to the game guide, that little area just south of the dead tree um, before you cross the bridge, according to the game guide, there are two secrets there, but it does a good job of not giving you exact locations. It's kind of more of a, a guide. as it- Well, especially uh, at this point in the game, I think we all have just got the blue candle, which you can only use once per screen, right? Oh yeah, so you got to go off the screen back, burn, 
off the screen back burn with a little Octorok just shooting his little ball at you the entire time. And the Zola or Zora, whichever translation you have, shooting fireballs at you if you happen to be near a lake. Oh, that's what I mean. Not Octorok. This is um, the Zora. The Zora. Shooting fireballs so, at you. So yeah, he's shooting fireballs at me. I'm like, dude, just stop. I want to burn this tree. Leave me alone or help me out and burn this tree yeah, for me. Yeah, burn the tree for me. You're shooting like, fire. Like, dude, like, I'll give you half of whatever I make get. Make yourself just useful. please cut out the, the crud. Um, see, I had credit not for you. Yeah, you thank can, you. You can say crap. Oh, crap. Cut the crap. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be using it liberally now. Um, I'm happy I could do that for yeah. you. So the crap Zora shooting his crap at me. Um, so anyway, but yeah, there, there were some times where I still found it frustrating, even with the guide, because I don't even know how many times I tried to burn trees. And I'm like, well, maybe I didn't burn the trees right. Let me go burn the same trees again. And nothing happened. Maybe I wasn't standing <laughs> far enough back and yeah. the fire didn't hit it correctly. Yeah. I'm, I'm still unclear on this. If you because the fire travels basically to walking spaces when you shoot it, right? And so I'm unclear. Does the fire need to land directly on the tree that burns or can it glide past it and the tree still burns? I know that's my question. So I was, I thought that too after I did it. And so I'm over here like trying to stand in the exact right place to burn a tree. And I just realized that that was not a good way to spend my time. Um, and the bombable walls, I, I'm sure that there's some that I've missed, um, but in within the dungeons, not to betray the dungeon map section of this game, but at least you kind of have some indicators of where, because they're all just four cornered rooms. And so there's areas without doors. And I'm like, okay, well, there's areas without doors. Maybe I can bomb those areas. I've been pretty lucky. Yeah. So I will say that I I have not discovered all of my secrets purely based on Phil's guide. Um, there are some that I think fall into a very classic Zelda pattern of like, there's a bombable wall on a piece of like geography that looks like it is hiding something, right? There's a boulder that is directly north of Dungeon 2. It's the screen directly north of it. And uh, it's just, it's a big old boulder sitting by itself in the middle of a sandy like pit area. And um, I, I saw that and my first thought was like, this looks like some place where there's like a bombable wall. Oh, and 100%. And there was. Yeah. yeah, I got over there. I'm like, I like that boulder. That's a mm, nice that, that, that's boulder. That's a nice boulder. <laughs> so I said, Bob's the pioneers <laughs> used to ride these babies for miles. <laughs> <laughs> Although that was a rock, not a boulder. So right. that's fair. But anyway, well, you, everyone gets the reference. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's areas that you're just like, I should bomb this. And most of the time they end up being correct. So I feel like I get some of that return. There'll also be a section of flat wall where I'm like, something along here is going to be bombable. And I'll use all eight bombs to no avail. So I may use the rewind function to recoup some uh, some bombage. As you should. I think that's a perfectly valid use of the rewind function. Uh, but anyway, like I, I like the amount of the map that we're kind of exploring here. There were some fun things to find. In this section, no doubt. I mean, um, I'm doing pretty good on hearts at this point. I think I ended this playthrough, um, not this playthrough. I, I ended this uh, this section of play for the week with uh, f- six. I think I completely filled the bottom row of hearts at the end of this one. So I, I'm definitely finding things. I'm definitely upgrading my armory. I, I did get the white sword as well. Um, and I definitely can't claim that I did that completely independent of looking at at the guide. Um, I knew that it was there. I did tell myself that I was not going to go in and get the white sword straight off the bat. Uh, I told myself I was going to wait until after the second dungeon to do that. Um, just for the sake of like, you know, keeping some difficulty challenge in, in those earlier dungeons. I know that a lot of people, uh, having done some research on this online this week, a lot of people really do just go grab a few hearts before they even go into dungeon one and just go straight and get that white sword. So, I mean, and, and to this game's credit, it's fun that you can do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the versatility, especially, you know, so think replay value for, is this 1992? This is 1985 or yeah, I was six. Yeah, say, this is pre-90s um, for sure. Shoot, I mean, even, even more impressive. But, so I, I keep thinking here, like, okay, so say I'm, you know, around when this game drops. Game's not long, right? So say you do have a guide, you're doing okay, you beat it. Well, what makes it interesting to go play again in a couple months or whenever you want to replay this game, it's the fact that you can do it different ways. And so say I remember from my first playthrough, well, yeah, after the third dungeon, I got the sword. Now I'm going to go get the sword right off the bat and make it a little different. Um, I don't think it's necessarily cheesing it. It's just using your, your skill and your knowledge to play it differently. Yeah. And I think kind of where we're all at with this is that, at least where I'm at, is I fully 
am excited by the prospect of coming back to this game down the road and playing it with just a little bit of baked in knowledge um, and, and and having a lot less help from a guide to go on. And I think that's nice because we're, we're all giving ourselves enough of a foundation of knowledge with this game to have a pleasantly challenging experience with it on playthrough two or three or whatever. Yeah, I agree. And at the risk of hogging the mic a little bit. So two other things that I've noticed that I don't believe y'all have touched on so far. So we, we know we talked about the, what do they call it in this one, where it, the sword carries whenever you have full hearts? Oh, the sword beam. Sword beam. So it definitely is not a sword beam in this game. It's Link throwing knives. <laughs> He's just ninja star. Well, so in that when I first did it, it kind of took me aback because I'm used to the sword beam from um, Link to the Past, right? But it's, it's very much a beam in that game. This one looks exactly like Link just threw his sword, and I had a freakout moment. The first time it happened, I'm like, oh, shoot, I just throw my sword, and now I, do I have to go pick it up? Did I lose this thing? <laughs> and then, no, it just happens when you have full hearts. It is the most OP thing in this entire game. Um, jumping ahead a little bit, when we got to the Lionel, I was like, oh, crud. Like, I know Lionel's from Breath of the Wild. I'm going to have a hard time with this. Oh man, I just obliterated that fool. I stood across the pond and just slung my knives at him, and he just had no chance. Yeah, I did that with arrows instead of sword beams, but yeah, same same result. Well, and the best thing is, I mean, you're totally right, Mike. The sword beam is probably more powerful in this game than it is in any other Zelda game, and it's great because it just like travels through everything. Blocks, sword beam don't care, goes right past them. Trees, sword beam don't care. Like you can snipe enemies from basically. Uh, any any spot on a screen that you want with that crazy beam. It's oh, awesome. It's amazing. And what confuses me is that you can do that with your wooden sword, which appears to have no magical ability. So what kind of wizardry is Link using to have this wooden sword he's swinging around? Like, I have a wooden sword from a Ren Fair. If I could swing this wooden sword and shoot beams at people, imagine me and my detective gear. So nice, nice suit with a wooden sword <laughs> strapped at my hip. <laughs> You've just robbed a bank. Detective Maker pulls a, a blade on you and he's like, don't make me swing it. <laughs> <laughs> this is Katana. She's got my back. I wouldn't recommend getting killed by her. Her sword traps the souls of its victims. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why that came to you based on what we were just talking about, but yes. <laughs> Deep cut. For all we know that Lee's Deep sword cut. does that too. <laughs> this is Katana. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, that's the second movie was better though. That movie so bad it's so bad <laughs> but so, so bad you almost love it i mean in some ways yeah i mean i i definitely love the honest movie trailer <laughs> much more than i love the movie oh there's no doubt about that oh <laughs> uh, no I, I mean no it's a good call and i do think that there's like it, it definitely is kind of showing again the prototypical nature of this game i think any zelda game after this one for the most part i think in a link to the past you can throw sword beams from the beginning but they're not nearly as powerful i think um a game that had been made 10 years after this uh you would have only been able to do that uh you would have only been able to throw your sword beam with like your level 2 sword or whatever and that's actually the case uh when we make it to Link's Awakening uh where you can't throw sword beams until you get the better sword from the seashell mansion so i i think that would have like definitely increased the difficulty exponentially in the early parts of this game yeah and not saying that i don't like it cuz it's definitely been kind of my go to um that and bombs but man it it just it's crazy the kind of different powers that you have straight from the beginning of this well, game. But also think about it, like we're using rewind function to drastically decrease the difficulty and backtracking that we're having to do. Without that rewind function, this sword beam is like almost ne almost necessary. Well, yeah, and you probably wouldn't have it nearly as often because you're going to be hitting yeah. hearts real hard. And so I tend to walk around with full hearts for the most part. I try not to use rewind too much in combat. Um, but occasionally, like if I if I make a bad move, I'm like, oh, you idiot. You just walked right into that. Yeah, I think, Matt, uh, you and I, we're not using the rewind really to get out of like tough scrapes in combat, right? I mean. Oh, no. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll take my hits when I deserve them. Like if I if I did something dumb, like walk straight into a, a lever, then, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take that hit on the yeah. uh, square in the face. I, I use my powers mostly financially. 
I absolutely agree. Mm. Although I will say to my credit, I won the rupee gambling game three times in a row without using the rewind function. Now he needs to go buy a lotto ticket. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so Matt, uh, where are you kind of at with the with the chunk of game that we played this week? Yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. I really enjoyed sniping the Zoras out of the uh, pond with my new bow. That was probably my favorite part. And also killing the Lionel and getting the white sword was super fun. Um, I I had a very hard time, even with uh, Phil's hand-drawn guide, finding the bridge over water to the third dungeon. I don't know why. I kept going too far south. So I kept like, where is this stupid bridge? And I was like, do I need the ladder or do I need the raft? And I was like, no, you can't because you get the raft in the third dungeon and the ladder you get in the fourth dungeon. So I was like, I must be doing something wrong here. So I spent a good amount of time wandering about in the south part of the map, uh, which did net me uh, full bombs, full hearts, and mostly full rupees by the time I got to the dungeon. So so that brings me to an interesting thing. You mentioned in the plot recap, Matt, that you had gone and bought arrows for the bow that we got in dungeon one. I did the same thing. Heck yeah. And I, I want to talk real quick about the unique ammo situation that this game employs um, for arrows, which is different than it's done in any other Zelda game. And I'm very curious as to why they did it. Um, did you notice the way that this ammo economy operates matt yeah one rupee equals one arrow yeah every time you shoot an arrow it deducts one rupee from your stash there's got to be some technical reason why they did it this way instead of having like a bank of arrows that you could run out of and then have to buy more but i say that and like bombs work that way you get eight bombs and so i then think my my thought here was they didn't have enough room in the ui to have another uh, slot for ammo because like if you look at it the ui on, on the top is kind of taken over already so it was either had to be it would have either had to be another item slot which this game you can only have one item equipped because it's uh, attached to the b button in which the nes only had a and a b button a is always your sword b is your item so you couldn't have it i mean i guess you could have theoretically had it as a uh as an item but I think you have to have the bow equipped, so it had to be either another ammo, which it doesn't look like they have room for, or it, you, it's like mutually exclusive item economy. So you're thinking it had to be either a controller issue or a, a programming issue instead right. of like a, a game design choice? I think so. At least that's kind of my head canon about this. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but maybe somebody knows. I do think I that one, one thing that the one interesting byproduct of this that I think is something that's actually missing from later Zelda games. We've talked about this in basically every other game that we played, which is that at some point we're just like swimming in rupees and it's no longer exciting to pick them up. Right. Right. And so I do think an interesting byproduct of them doing it this way is that it is perpetually good and exciting for me to pick up more rupees because now I've got more ammo for the bow, you know? Yeah. I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. I found myself, almost going like, all right, I used one arrow in this uh, screen grab, uh, so I'm going to try to find a rupee to replace that and then not and then try to not use my bow as often until I can replace that rupee that I just used. And that's less so whenever I was flush with cash after cheating my way through the rupee gambling game. Um, but when I went and bought... What did I buy? That was 250 rupees. I went and bought the candle. Probably the, it's the ring. It's the blue I ring. I haven't bought the blue ring yet. Oh, really? Nuh-uh. Uh, so I think it was the candle that was like 150 or something. And uh, uh, after I bought that, I was like, okay, maybe I need to be a little more conservative with my... The candle ammo. is 60 rupees. The magic shield is 160. Uh, I don't know what I bought then. It was something. I bought something that was expensive. <laughs> it's probably a nice jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I am flush with jackets in real life. That's for sure. We <laughs> way too many jackets that anyone living in Texas should have. I'm in that boat with you. So anyway, that's a fun little little bit of trivia about the way that the bow works. I will say that uh, I was not using it quite as much as I think you said that you were, Matt. And I probably will start doing that more as the enemies get more difficult and more like populous <laughs> yeah i i really like the bow because it's it's the same power as the white sword so it will one shot most things um early on in the game so that was fun for me i used it a lot against the armos especially the fast moving armos i was like get away from me satan and uh blasted it with an arrow nice 
Uh, do either of you have anything else that you want to say about this section of the game generally before we get into talking about the dungeons? Mm. That's dungeon. Dungeon. All right, that brings us into part three of the Sacred Realms Rundown, which is the dungeon map in which we talk about the dungeons that we played this week from mechanics to music and more. Of course, the dungeons don't really have mechanics and they all have the same soundtrack, so we'll have to find some other things to talk about. (laughs) But the dungeons that we're talking about today are Dungeon 2, Moon, and Dungeon 3, Manji. Let's go ahead and start with Moon, which I think, if nothing else, has got the most accurate, like, map silhouette to what it's supposed to be, like you know, representing <laughs> of, of anything else, right? I mean, it looks like a moon. It looks like a crescent moon. It does indeed. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just to get right into this, this one is uh, still not a very long dungeon. Uh, it's not much longer than Dungeon 1. Um, there were some things in here that I really liked just from a combat and exploration standpoint. Um, I will say that I figured out very quickly upon entering this dungeon something that was brought up in our Discord channel a few days ago, which is uh, which I did not know previous to getting into this dungeon and realizing that I already had like four keys, was that keys are universal in this game. Any key that you get in a dungeon or that you buy from a shop in the overworld is usable in any other dungeon. They are not exclusive to the dungeons you find them in. So um, I definitely think that that made a little bit of my exploration a bit easier in this dungeon because I was like pretty flush with keys already, Um, which is interesting. I think one thing I'd like to note about this dungeon is that even though it's not too much more difficult from a combat perspective from the first dungeon, we do have a mini boss technically in here, which we did not in the first dungeon. I thought that was a that was a fun like first for this game. Yep. Senor Moldorm. Yes. Uh, notably much easier than Moldorm oh that we fight gosh, in so other ma- And much, looks much less like a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> Way less like a hamburger. It's actually interesting because this version of the Moldorm is a lot more similar to the crazy like sandworm that's in Link's Awakening. Uh, the one that you have to kill to get the angler's key where it's kind of like dipping in and out of the sand and you have to hit its face in order to kill it. Yeah, I also thought that it was one of those energy um, enemies like from some other top-down Zeldas that you see that you can't damage. Like, I think in Link's Awakening, you can only damage those energy ball enemies with the boomerang. So I actually didn't kill Muldorm. I just ran away from it trying to not get hurt because I didn't think I could damage it. And then eventually I got to the point where I was like, this guy must be guarding a key because unlike you, I use keys because I I explore every single room and every single dungeon because I never know where the item is. Um, and I also am a weird completionist like that. So uh, I was like running away from it and ended up with not all the keys and there was one locked door, even though I'd already killed King Dodongo. I was like, I need to get into this locked door. So I went back and was like, maybe if I bomb this guy, he'll die. And that's exactly what I did. Yeah, got a key. So the sprite from this Moldorm, I definitely noticed this, Matt. I mean, it ma- it looks like it's made up of energy balls. They definitely reused some some energy ish sprites from somewhere else in this game and used it to create something. They're like, oh, that looks like a worm, I think. So um, I definitely understand your confusion there. I thought it was very funny because after you kill Moldorm and you get the key to drop, you start to realize just what a limited color palette they have to work with in this game because the key is the exact same color as the floor that and it, it drops on. It blends in almost perfectly. Yeah, it was a little disorienting. But so I I definitely enjoy having like a new enemy to fight in here. Another thing that I thought was really interesting about this dungeon is that um, I started going on a spree of bombing walls to try and and see if there was like any secret path that you can take that didn't involve having to use keys. Uh, Because what I'm learning is that most of these dungeons do have that. Like, and I think that that is, um, I, I think Phil mentioned last week that that is kind of like a safeguard that this game has against you being in a dungeon and not being able to progress because you have used keys and like in a, in a way that has you running through them before, you know, uh, like, like to where you have zero and you can't progress, right? There are safeguards against that in the form of bombable walls. And uh, if you kind of look at a map of this dungeon, I'm looking at Phil's right now, the entire, uh, the entire eastern edge of this dungeon, the topmost wall in each of those rooms is bombable. And you can just progress all the way up that row or up that column of of dungeon rooms just by using bombs. So that's interesting. One of the rooms that it does bring you to is a fight with Blue Gorilla. We we fought red ones in Eagle, and that gets us a magical boomerang, an upgrade to the, the regular boomerang that we get in the first dungeon. 
Does anybody know what the difference is? Because I honestly couldn't tell what the difference between the regular boomerang and the magic boomerang is. Could you tell, Mike? No, I just throw it at things. Uh, it. I know it travels further. I couldn't tell you if it travels faster or not. I think there are some enemies that couldn't be damaged with the OG boomerang too that can be with this one, but that might just be me. So uh, the guide tells us that the magic boomerang, where is it? Here it is, faster than the standard boomerang and also moves a greater distance. So there you go. Well, look at that. Phil with answers magic. the question for us. Yeah, you just throw, throw your magic. <laughs> I thought that, I thought this was so weird though, right? Because I feel like uh, in a more modern Zelda game, you would not get the base boomerang in one dungeon and then immediately get the better one in the next dungeon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a little odd, um, being able to get essentially the same item twice back to back. I would think in a later Zelda, it would be cool. You get your OG boomerang first and then like maybe dungeon five or six. Yeah. You get an upgraded version. Not to say that I, I mean, I actually don't use the boomerang that often. Um, not to say that it's not cool to get an upgrade so early, but I just haven't found a need for the boomerang because you've got so many other ranged options. You already have the bow and you already have the sword beams. So I don't find myself needing it very often. Yeah, I, I don't think that I really use the boomerang hardly at all, honestly. Also, I think it's interesting that um, the color palette for upgrade is kind of flip-flopped in this case, whereas the original boomerang is reddish. It's, I think it's supposed to be brown, but it comes across as red. The upgrade is blue, but in every other instance in the game, the upgraded version goes from blue to red. Like the blue candle goes to the red candle, the blue ring goes to the red ring. Um, so that's just kind of an interesting thing that I noticed. Good call out, Matt. Good observation. I had not noticed that. Well, thank you. Um, I So here's a question. Actually, I'm going to come back to this in the next dungeon because I'm realizing now, uh, you know, we've all said before that it is totally possible. Matt, I think you said in chapter one, you got to the boss well in advance of like having cleared all the rooms. Like you just yep. basically stumbled upon Aquamentus in the first dungeon. Yes. The thing that I kind of like about this dungeon is that they place the boss at the very far end of it. So I think it's a lot more difficult to do that. Yep. It's more linear in its progression where like uh, what what we would think of as the Zeldas that we've played before, <laughs> obviously, where the boss is the last thing you find. Um, this dungeon kind of naturally does that because of its more linear structure, whereas like even in Dungeon 4 that, or Dungeon 3, that's very much not the case. So a uh, 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 good call out. Yes. But even with that being said, so I'm, I'm getting used to the size of these dungeons a little bit more as I go, but... I came across King Dodongo, what it felt like very quickly in this dungeon. I didn't think that he was the main boss. I'm thinking this is like a baby Dodongo that you're having to I thought fight. that too. And so, I mean, I, what, you hit him with two or three bombs and he's done. I didn't lose any hearts. And it's just like, okay, cool. That was a nice little mini boss till I get to the king. And all of a sudden you're at the Triforce piece. Like I killed Dodongo and went into the next room expecting to find King Dodongo. And I was like, oh, never mind. Okay, that was cool. One interesting thing I noticed too is, so I, again, referencing the game guide, did this for Aquamentis and also King Dodongo, but the art on, on Phil's game guide oh, it's amazing, makes them it? look so much more menacing and, and boss-like than the game actually makes them. Like Aquamentis is a dragon that's maybe twice the size of your little sprite. Yeah. King Dodongo is roughly the same size as exactly. you. And then you've got the art that makes him look like Dodongo from Ocarina. Yeah. And so he, you know, he's huge and you're throwing bombs into his mouth here. I'm just like, okay, little buddy, come follow me and take a bomb. <laughs> yeah. And that's honestly going with Ocarina in mind. That's why I thought this was not King Dodongo. Cause he was the same size as me. And like, obviously in Ocarina, you have the small Dodongos, which are roughly the same size, a little bit bigger than Link, but then King Dodongo is massive. Right. And that's what I was thinking when I, I knew this boss was Dodongo because reading Phil's guide and I saw this, uh, Triceratops looking mofo and was like, Oh, you're your little baby Triceratops. I'm gonna kill you and go fight your daddy. And then I was like, Oh, well, never mind. That, that you were, you were the King. Cool. Yeah, I think a lot of that is just the scale of, of these sprites and enemies. I think that um, there's something about having a lot of knowledge with the Zelda series where you just expect the boss to be massive, right? And I think even the, even the next main entry that I've played after this one, I don't know what it's like in Zelda 2, but in Link to the Past, I mean, we're firmly in the camp of like, oh, these bosses are like giant assholes, right? Yeah, they're big, they're bad, and they feel more boss-like. 
I have a new headcanon, Lyndon, based off the Triceratops King Dodongo. Oh, tell me. In Jurassic Park, the Triceratops they find that's sick. Yeah. Just fought Link, ate too many bombs. Oh, uh, that's why he had those tummy problems? Yeah, so mm. Ellie, you know, she thought it was in his poop, and she's finding actual, you know, like, remnants of the bombs. Yeah. yeah. And she pulls it out, and it's like, oh, this is a, a leaf they're not supposed to eat. Nah, dude, that's a bomb flower. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now disappointed that this, uh, this boss fight doesn't involve Link having to dig through, like, a massive pile of dino crap with his bare hands, <laughs> right? Like, it just seems proper. Um, no, I, I think it, it's a really interesting uh, difference, really, between this early game and later ones. Um, of course, like, you know, we having fought Dodongos in lots of other Zelda games, we all kind of know, throw a bomb in the mouth, and that's what gets you your win. Um, I do think it's funny because um, the way that this boss sort of works, like being top down in this way and just kind of moving like top to bottom, left to right, it works very similar to the mini boss Dodongos that you fight in Link's Awakening, uh, except there you have to fight them two at a time and they each take three bombs to kill Mm -hmm. and sometimes they they also look like weird blobs they do yeah they do dinosaurs yes but they they are dodongos in that game is is what they're called um they don't look anything like them but uh but even those have got a little bit of extra difficulty that makes them i I think a little bit more challenging to fight because sometimes they'll turn at the last minute and not swallow the bomb or whatever uh this guy is pretty pretty simple to to take down yeah he's simple um, but, you know, simple doesn't mean bad. You know, nah. you, you still have to use a, a different technique to to bring him on versus other ones. You can't ones. damage him with swords or arrows or sword beams at and, all. You have so, to do bombs. And we're going off uh, 20 plus years of Zelda experience at this point when we come to this game. So I could see this for, for a person who this is their first entry to The Legend of Zelda, not having all the previous Dodongo experience that we have, not knowing that he needs to have bombs to, to go and this being a much more difficult fight. And of course, the hint that we get from the hint room in this dungeon does tell us directly, or I guess somewhat indirectly because the language is non-specific, but the hint is Dodongo dislikes smoke, right? Um, so obviously we know what that means is throw bombs in the Dodongo's mouth. Uh, I think it's difficult because one, how are you supposed to know that this thing is called a Dodongo when you come across it in the game for the first time, right? I guess if you've read the guide that came packed in with the game, it does have a list of all the bosses, right? So you know that there is one called Dodongo. I can't remember if it tells you that it's the boss of this dungeon or not, but um, but anyway, so I guess that that is a little bit of a hint, however useful or not that it that it is or, or, is, or is not, uh, depending on the context that you have from like reading extra material, but... Yeah, I mean, also he just kind of looks like a Dodongo. Like you look at him, oh man, you 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 have a Dodongo. You are a look Dodongo you. looking mofo. <laughs> exactly. Sure, why not? So yeah. I had another thought that's kind of offbeat, but I think it applies. So it says in the beginning of this game that Impa took the pieces of the Triforce and hid them. Correct. Correct. So you've got to think that this might be the setting up Impa to kind of be like a secret badass. Because she had to get past every one of these bosses herself to hide the pieces of Triforce. Uh, it seems like without killing them, but somehow sneak past them or subdue them to hide the pieces. And so she made it through each of these dungeons herself to set the pieces up for you. Or did she populate the dungeons with the enemies to prevent Ganon from getting there? So really, <laughs> she's just a bitch. Impa is like secretly just a big old like monster person. She has like a menagerie of lethal monsters and she's like, you know, I've been saving these guys for a rainy day. Might as well drop them in these <laughs> dungeons to protect the Triforce. She, she's the Hagrid of the Zelda universe where she, it's not a, it's just a baby dragon. It's fine. Look at him. He recognizes his mummy. Get <laughs> <laughs> Get real awkward at the end of the game when you have to go tell Impa that you killed all her children, all her pets. <laughs> Those are all my babies. Yeah, why did you kill them if you just scratched them behind the ears and played them some <laughs> just, music? Just playing some music, he falls right asleep. <laughs> I should not have said that. <laughs> You're like, oh, Impa, this is this is awkward. I'm sorry. I don't know how to tell you this. Um, <laughs> good news saved the world. <laughs> Bad news. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I do More have a random. Cannon, yeah. I do have a random thought. Um, what other boss in the Zelda universe is Link's size other than Girahim and Dodongo? I like, I'm struggling to think of one off the top of my head. 
I don't know. I can't think of anything. Cool. I, just, I thought it might have just well, been me. And I haven't played all these like. bosses yet, so maybe we'll find another one in this game. That's true. So does anybody have anything else to say about Moon before we move on to Dungeon 3? Nah. No, I, I enjoyed Moon. It was a good second dungeon. Uh, not terribly challenging, but yeah, I was entertained. Well, then let's go ahead and move on to dungeon number three, Manji, with its uh, problematic AF floor layout. <laughs> so <laughs> so, should, we, so we, should we just clear this up real quick before we get further into this? Because this dungeon is straight up a swastika. It's a swastika. Yeah. If you feel the need, let's cover it. So I did a little bit of research into this. Of course, you know, we all look, obviously the swastika as a symbol has a, a highly bad connotation in, in the modern era. Um, thanks for nothing, Hitler. So and even in even in the era in which this game was designed, let's be clear. Well, right, exactly. However, you do have to remember that. Um, so with the with the swastika being originally a symbol uh, taken from a variety of of Eastern cultures, you know, um, it, let, let's get through this and then we'll do another okay, one. Okay, fine. Uh, we're going to be basically done by the time we get through this dungeon. Okay, fine. Drink break. Well, finish your thought, and then we'll do drink break. <laughs> He's already stopped his thought. Well, we'll get back into okay. Manji. Yeah. So we all know that the the swastika was originally a symbol that was kind of used in a, in a variety of Eastern faiths, right, to denote, um, you know, various things, uh, good luck, long life, stuff like that. Um, so I think that's definitely where the inspiration for this really comes from. Uh, it is worth noting as well that even though technically the manji, as it is dis- depicted here, is a swastika, the swastika is actually pointing a different direction. It's like a, it's like flipped it's like mirrored from this one and apparently that is symbolically important like from a from like a a linguistic standpoint i guess um so yeah all that is to say i don't think that there was any like hidden white power message happening here no Uh, of course there was there's no way in hell that this would have flown in even a even a Japanese made game ten years after this, right? But like for sure. But I, I think that you know, no no ill intent meant. It is one of those things that's just like a little unfortunately uncomfortable now. Um, you know, just because of all the negative historical context behind it. But um, yes, we're you know it it we are we are choosing to interpret this in the spirit in which it was originally created, which is uh, an homage to Eastern religion. <laughs> And not Nazism. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of different representations of that. But I do have just a kind of thought in my head of I wonder if any— like, So you know how in, in the 80s people believe that D&D was devil worship? Yeah. And there, there was actually a movement to have D&D canceled um, you know, before cancel culture yeah. because of that. I wonder if any mom looked over their kid's shoulder at their game system at that specific point when they have the map pulled up and was like, what is my child playing? I think that is a very accurate thing to think and question. Yeah, It's so funny because I've been watching season four of Stranger, Stranger Things, Things, right? Where like they get the whole town worked up into a frenzy about like, oh, the, the kids who play D&D are worshiping Satan. You know, I may or may not have a Hellfire shirt on order. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you should. Hellfire Club for life. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm sure that that happened at some point. And yeah, I don't know. It's just it's one of those weird little quirky things that, you know, it it's here and we can we can speculate about how it came to be and we can be pretty self-assured that it's never, ever going to happen again. So, yeah. And now we're in the Manji. And now we are in the Manji, not Jumanji, the Manji. <laughs> so now that we've gotten past our necessary discussion about the the weird ass layout of this dungeon, let's go ahead and start talking about the dungeon itself. Obviously, what we have here is a much less linear dungeon than what we had with Moon. Um, a lot of different ways that you can kind of tackle this. Um, this is definitely one where I think <laughs> you could very, very easily just stumble straight into the boss's room without like without even trying to so guess who did stumble upon this boss uh me <laughs> who, who has two thumbs and stumbled across this boss completely by accident me mike maker <laughs> yeah so yeah i i did not expect to come across uh ye old boss um but i got to him fairly quickly and i think it's because i went immediately right and just started exploring and then ended up in the boss room and it was another thing where i'm like okay is this the real boss or a mini boss and he starts coming at me I just decided to drop a bomb and walk the other way, 
and he walks over it perfect. He he set me up, and I batted a hundred <laughs> or a thousand. A thousand. There you go. So I mean, tackling the boss right at the beginning of this whole dungeon conversation. But yes, Manhandla can be defeated in one go if you have a perfectly placed bomb. It will destroy all four heads at one time. The only other way to do it is to just sword slash the heads a little, you know, few at a time. Um, the problem with that is that as he gains less heads, he starts moving faster and shooting more energy balls. As he gains less heads, as he um, Loses I don't know. Heads. As he, yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> less head, less heads, more balls, yeah. <laughs> and speed. <laughs> He's unencumbered by heads. <laughs> um, no, but okay. So, but yes, and I, I think that that's so interesting that you can just again stumble completely by accident across this boss there's more than one way to do it too looking at this map um i did not try to bomb as many walls in this dungeon as i did in the last one but there's like it looked like the third room that you can get to in this dungeon you can bomb one of its walls and that wall will take you straight into the boss chamber like you don't even have to go so there's like a room right below manhandler with um what does it have it's got like a few gels and some other enemies in it and uh usually you have to go through that room tackle all the enemies and then you can go fight the boss you can bypass all of that and just bomb your way straight into his chamber which is exactly what i did yeah it yeah? was I, I well i i walked into the room with like there's like five uh dark nuts in it and Killed all of them, but I was pretty low on hearts and just like kept going and walked right into the boss room and pretty much died immediately because I didn't realize it was the boss. And so I rewound and then did it again. Uh, I rewound all the way to the beginning of the dark nut room so I didn't lose quite so many hearts. Walked in, walked back in because again, I thought it was like maybe another mini boss situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got two of his heads with one bomb and then he's just flying. And I was like, oh, dang it. And so I'm running around the map trying to continue to bomb him and it's just not working because he's moving too fast. So I ended up just slicing off all of his heads so and uh, went, went the rest of the dungeon with like a heart and a half, basically. <laughs> so think about this in the reverse though. You're a manhandler just sitting there photosynthesizing and this little green butthole blows a <laughs> hole into your room and starts chucking bombs at you. Like, what are you supposed to do? I mean, when you put it that way, I feel like I really empathize with Manhandlo's point of view here, right? I mean, he's are, just trying are to grow, we the bad guy? He's just trying to grow a fifth head and you're over here <laughs> shutting him down. Uh, pour one out for Manhandla, who truly did not deserve what we did to him. Um, so let, let's kind of get back to the dungeon itself now that we've kind of gone straight to the <laughs> end or I guess the beginning and talked about the boss. Um, this one I think is really interesting because there's a lot of keys that we can pick up here. And I think truly the, the intention is for you to maybe be able to like just load up on keys here for use later because you certainly don't need them, um, for every door in this dungeon. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting. So the item that we get from this dungeon is the raft. And the raft is 1,000% necessary to progress all the way through this game. Um, but you do not have to use it to do anything in the dungeon itself. So I can totally see a situation cropping up where a person goes and beats this dungeon, gets the Triforce piece, and didn't even know the raft was there, right? Oh, easily. I, I didn't know that the raft was there except for the fact that I had uh, – looked up on Phil's guide where to get the raft because I wanted to go explore a little bit in the water and was like, oh, it's in the third dungeon. So after I beat Manhandela, uh, walked up into the room with the Triforce, I was like, well, the raft has to be in here somewhere. So went and explored the rest of the dungeon. It was very annoying. And I, so, yeah, definitely, I think, um, I'm sure a lot of people have kind of come up across a frustrating moment where that is concerned. I do sort of like it just because I think, the base fantasy of a dungeon in a Zelda game is just this abandoned uh, underground labyrinth, right? And of course, it's got something in there that you need. We're looking for Triforce pieces, right? But if we were just like exploring, I, I don't know, like ancient tombs or if we were doing Indiana Jones in, in real life and found a place like this, if there was a treasure buried further within the dungeon and you didn't need that treasure to progress through the dungeon, then of course you would never know that it's there unless you just happen to cross it, right? So I think that actually kind of lends to the realism of the fantasy, you know, of, of like these abandoned labyrinths. Um, like, I don't know. I think it's something that later Zelda games get away from a little bit. I don't know what the solution is necessarily because I do like 
having to use the item you find in the dungeon to clear the dungeon. Like it leads to more complex puzzles. It can lead to dungeons feeling like they've got two phases essentially, right? You've got the, like for, for a lot of Zelda dungeons, um, going forward in the rest of the series, you've got like the pre getting the item phase of the dungeon. And then after you get the item, you go back through and new parts of the dungeon open up, or you can like open up doors in rooms that had a puzzle that you couldn't previously clear. Right? Like the amount of extra dungeon it gives you when you do it that way, it can't be discounted, but I don't know. I just, I think there's something neat about the fantasy of, of the thing when it's done this way. Yeah. I mean, when you put it that way, it, it definitely has a different kind of aesthetic. Isn't exactly the right word, but a different kind of feel to it. So I, I can appreciate that a, a little bit. Um, I don't think that that necessarily takes away from my frustration if I were on the receiving end of beating this dungeon, not getting the raft and then being unable to do a lot of things that the later game requires and then just having to like go back through everything you've done to try to find the raft. I will say the one thing we've talked about how this game just does not have a lot of signposting in it. The one thing that we are able to rely on so far up until this point, I don't know if this is true for every dungeon, but so far every dungeon has an item besides the Triforce. Right. And so you at least have kind of got that. Right. And also you've got the fact that once you get the map, you can see that there are rooms that you have not visited before. So it's not like for for a person who is playing this game the way it's meant to be played, you know, clearing dungeons and finding items within them. um, They they will probably find this. But like if you're speed running this thing or if you just get to the boss immediately and get the Triforce and get out, then, yeah, that becomes a problem for you. So I guess this is really the incentive to make sure that, yes, you're getting the map. You are clearing all of the rooms, um, you know, nine times out of ten. All you're going to get is another key that you probably don't even need. But that tenth time, hey, uh, you are getting an item that you need to actually beat the game. I mean, I I think you're correct in saying that you kind of have to go by the the previous knowledge that you get an item per for level or per dungeon at this point. And so if you haven't got that, then you would go back and get that. But I, I think they're really banking on your desire to explore in these games. Cause I, I know that me and Matt are kind of completionists at least. So if I see there's rooms I haven't explored, I'm going to go see them just to say I've been there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if, if you're not that kind of player, I could see that becoming very frustrating. And so then you get to the area where you need this and you don't have it. How much of the game have you gone past at that point so you don't know how much you have to backtrack? I think that would be very frustrating. Yeah, definitely. The other thing that we do have to remember is that you do get a compass in each of these dungeons, right? And the compass does tells you, tell you where the Triforce piece is. So, you know, using that line of reasoning, uh, assuming that you get the compass, because again, this is all predicated on you not stumbling straight into the boss as soon as you get in, right? But once you get the compass, then you can kind of logic the thing and be like, okay, this is the last place that I need to go. But I do think that it's very interesting that the boss is not in the very top branch of this dungeon, the way that Dodongo was in Moon. Like, if I was sitting around, like, designing dungeons for a top-down adventure game, that's probably where I would try to put it, right? The furthest possible distance from the entrance. Um, and yeah, that is just not what was done here. Well, no, but you're, and you're, you're also having them do this as a stepping stone. You know, this is the third dungeon they've made, and so they're waiting on feedback from how this game goes, I, I'm sure at some point, to see how they need to go for the next game. I'm curious to see if some of these same kind of quirks are in Zelda 2. Because in this one, yet yeah, you don't have to go anywhere near the raft to be able to beat this dungeon. And if you weren't completionist, if you didn't get the compass, which is also to the left, mm-hmm. um, would you have any knowledge that you missed the raft here? Um, but... From most of my Zelda experience, you either use the item you get within that dungeon to beat the boss, or it is on the way to the boss in such a way where it's kind of hard to miss. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if this kind of issue might have caused enough feedback to where they thought they had to correct that. Well, and I do think it's interesting, too. I mean, the the hint room that we get in this dungeon uh, doesn't talk about anything specific to this dungeon. The hint that you get here is, did you get the sword from the old man on top of the waterfall? Obviously, that's pushing you towards getting the white sword, which, cool, great hint, really appreciate it, you know? But it makes me wonder, like, why wasn't there a version of this where the hint is you might need a raft for like other parts of this game. And it's not even that the hint is telling you that the raft is in this dungeon, but like it's one extra layer of, 
there is a raft and you have to get it and maybe you should check this dungeon for it, you know? Yeah, the only thing you have indicating that you would need a raft, again, is the game guide, which as we talked about with Phil and over the last couple episodes, the game guide is such an integral part of this game experience that that's really your key, right? That's your key to understanding that the raft is something you need, but there's no key to understanding that the raft is in this dungeon. Well, because even when you get to a raft platform later, it's not like you step on the platform and then it gives you a text bubble that's like, like, oh, this is interesting. If only I had a raft, then I could cross this expanse of water. Right. right. Like, you've really got nothing. It's just, yeah, it, again, we're relying on knowledge that you get from reading extra materials that were packaged in with this game. Just a completely absurd thing that that would never be done now. But it's all part of the charm of this game, really. Fiend. <laughs> cool yeah i mean I, I've, got, I've got nothing more to add there really i think yeah you you wrapped that up nicely hey glad to do it um in terms of enemies in this dungeon we do have bubbles uh which i think is the first appearance of them in this game these guys are kind of a pain in the ass especially because in later zelda games they have kind of like set paths that they stick to like either they either they like roll around blocks in the middle of rooms or they roll around the edge of rooms or whatever and in this one they just kind of mosey um, and it really does suck getting bounced by one of these guys because then you can't pull your sword for a little while. Um, that's a huge pain in the butt, especially because the enemy density does start to kind of increase in this dungeon. Um, and the enemies do start getting a little harder. I love enemy density. I don't know. I, I find I found this dungeon more rewarding than most of the other ones. Well, and for I, some reason. And actually, I want to talk about that for a second, because you of all people who have expressed frustration with top down combat previous to this game like you've kind of gone on at some length about it yeah i mean the rewind function here is really helpful because i don't just (laughs) if i if i die i can just backtrack and be like all right maybe i approach this a different way whereas like every other top down we've played you die you get a game over go back to the beginning right which is fine like it is what it is but there's there's a certain level of forgiveness here that comes with the rewind function and as i said in our discord channel we stand the rewind function and states and save states for this game so uh, I, that lends it less frustration for me being able to um kind of <laughs> go in with uh guns blazing and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't and then uh but not be overly punished for it, I guess. And I think that's it. Just the the level of punishment you want to take in this game. Because again, if you didn't have the game guide and you didn't use the rewind function at all, I feel like this would be a very frustrating game. Yeah. Um, But the and again i don't try and use it in combat as much as i can for sure but i don't let myself die yeah it, th- that's where i draw the line mostly as well like as long as i don't die i i continue on even if i have half a heart like i'll continue on right. I, I don't but dying doesn't start me back at the beginning of the dungeon and have to backtrack all the way through yeah i agree Yep, I think that that's a good line to draw things at. Does anybody else have anything to say about Manji before we move out of the dungeon map? Manhandala is easily the most wild and outrageous name for a boss I've ever seen. (laughs) It's kind of a wild and outrageous looking boss, too. I mean, it's like a four headed. uh, What's the uh, the man eating or the Venus flytrap? Yeah, it's like a four headed Venus flytrap. Little Shop of Horrors, dude. Oh, yeah, that's better. Mm -hmm. You were in that play, Lyndon. What's that thing called? It's uh, Audrey 2 is the name of that plant. <laughs> there you go. So yeah. this is Audrey 4. Yeah, this is Audrey, <laughs> Audrey 4. <laughs> yeah, no one wants to be manhandled by manhandled. Uh, no, no, not at all. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on to part four, which is Bloopy Trails, where we talk about interesting things that diverted our attention. Mike, I'm going to let you go first on this one. Um, so, I mean, there is room for a lot of Bloopy Trail in this game, depending on how much exploration you do. Um, between these two dungeons, I, I did follow a pretty quick kind of by the guide i'm gonna go straight two points um and not to get too far ahead of us but i bloopy trailed around the third dungeon a little bit uh found a potion shop bought some potions i did go up and find the item shop north of dungeon three Mm. which held the sweet sweet blue ring Mm -hmm. and so i went and uh I, i made most of my money by normally gotten gains mm-hmm. uh, fighting the enemies and uh shaking down a bunch of of moblins <laughs> yeah <laughs> is link the bad guy I, again i don't know there's yeah. a case to be made i'm gonna, I'm gonna tell Ganon what you did <laughs> it's, it's a secret from everyone <laughs> and so I, I shook down a couple of these guys uh got my rupees up 
I, I did go play a, a time or two at the the Rupee Games, and then I went and got this blue ring, which gives you these sweet white robes. And so you Ooh. know, you, you look pretty. I, pretty say, I haven't gotten it yet, so I'm excited. You now. look pretty sweet whenever you have the, this and like the white sword. Gandalf the white. Yeah, awesome. you don't have to fight a Balrog to get it either. Well, that's cool. You just ring. buy it. <laughs> yep. And what if it's a ring of power? Ooh. Ooh. But secretly, another ring was made <laughs> in the land of Mordor, in the fires of Mount Doom. <laughs> Man, we just like go all over Man, the place on this got, podcast. We got Harry don't Potter, we? we got Lord of the Rings, we got Star, Star Trek, Trek, Suicide Squad. <laughs> <laughs> I was really proud of that one. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> this is Katana. <laughs> God. Okay. No. So I did not get the blue ring this week, but just uh, in case we haven't mentioned it before, the blue ring does in fact half the amount of damage that you take from enemies. So definitely, uh, definitely a big one to get in this game, and I, I plan on getting it very soon. Um, I also, you know, most of my Blue Trail stuff was Ruby Games, getting the White Sword, which is definitely a big one. Um, I did purchase the Magic Shield. Which, this was a little unclear. I thought that what was happening here was that it was just a rego shield you could See, buy from I the thought that guys. too. That's why I didn't buy With it. With a price hike. And I was like, yeah, I don't I want your I don't want to buy another shield. Sh- I was like, it maybe. so similar. Yeah, maybe if you get your shield eaten by a like-like or something, you have to rebuy the shield. That's what I thought it yes, was. Yes, and that's exactly what I thought it was too. But no, it is. In, so you have your base shield all the time, no matter what. Like, like likes can't take it from you. You always have it. But once you buy a shield, it's the magic shield, and like likes can take that one. Um, and you, oh, well, that sucks. And then you have to go buy it again. The the magic shield, um, basically, it deflects uh, magic attacks. It doesn't deflect like the Zora fireballs. Yes, the Zora fireballs being the big one. Got so, it. well, got, then I will definitely go purchase that. Yeah, got that, and it was it was definitely <laughs> useful and helpful. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, mostly just heart containers for me, uh, obviously. Uh, and then I, I did track down a few. I tracked down um, the Moblin in the in the northeast of the map um, who gives you 100 rupees. And that one is actually kind of difficult to find because there's no, like, you can't bomb a wall to get to it. Um, you Like, there's this stretch of wall that you just have to, like, you have to push the D-pad up. And it's like you're climbing a ladder, but you look like you're just walking through the wall. Interesting. And you would never know that it's there. But huh. but yes, in the in the very uh, in the very top east north northeast corner of the map, um, there is a moblin who will give you 100 rupees. And I think actually um, it's been brought up that the hint that you get in the first dungeon um, about eastmost peninsula is the secret or whatever. I think most people kind of agree that this is what it's referencing. So. Um, because oh, I wanted to tell you in the the episode where y'all talked about it. So the first episode where you talk about the Eastmost Peninsula being that block you move. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. it's on the west. It's of the that. west. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, we I messed that one up. Yeah, not, so yeah, no, I so I thought Eastmost Peninsula in that context meant that that's where the boss was because that is the easternmost part of the dungeon. I mean, I guess you could leave it up to interpretation. But whenever y'all were like, oh yeah, the Eastmost block, I'm like, it ain't east. Yep, no, you're wrong. It was west. We got that it was wrong. Linden's mistake. Were you by even the way. scouts? It was that yeah. was Linden's mistake not mine i'm not owning that one i i appreciate you like trying to for a second and then realizing that it was not yours to own <laughs> um but yes so yeah go get that hundred rupees from that moblin it's a pretty good bloopy trail up there matt how about yourself uh my biggest bloopy trail was getting the white sword from that lionel uh that was a lot of fun for me i did actually a decent amount of exploring around the um death mountain hillside there's not much else you can get that I found anyway, uh, other than the white sword. Um, I did go get the potion shop as well. So I bought a life healing potion, which was fun for me. Uh, and I tried my hardest to get over to, um, there's this, whatever this is up here in this top Northeast corner, but you can't do it without a raft. So I actually spent a, a bit of time looking around for the raft until I just gave up and looked at Phil's guide. and was like, Oh, it's in the third dungeon. So, uh, that was mostly me. I did, uh, rupee gambling. I did a lot of, uh, moblin killing. I, I really had fun burning the moblins to death with the candle. Um, so that was fun for me. 
a kind of a pyro. Can't wait to get the red candle and be able to just like chuck do that fire. all the time. <laughs> yeah, with no restrictions. So that'll be a good time. Well, let's go ahead and move into part five, which is Z targeting, where we talk about fascinating characters or enemies that we happen to cross. Um, I actually specifically did not mention one of the enemies in Dungeon Three because I wanted to save it for Z targeting. Um, I'm talking, of course, about the Dark Nuts, uh, which you meet for the first time in Dungeon Three. They cannot be damaged from the front. You can only damage them from the rear or actually kind of like the top or the bottom. So I I think it's just fun because I think, uh, you know, they're one of the first enemies in this game that have like conditions to damage or at least one of the first main enemies, right? Like most anything else so far, you can sort of just like, sure, it might move faster or slower, but you can damage it from anywhere. So I thought that it was fun, especially just because uh, this dungeon sort of has a way of packing a lot of these dudes into rooms at one time. You know, Uh, the room right before you go down to get the raft, there's like five of these dudes in there. Yeah, that was a painful room, as I said earlier in the episode. Right. But I think it is fun because, um, you know, obviously we're seeing the first incarnations of a lot of Zelda enemies in this game. Uh, Most of these guys show up in multiple other Zelda games. Moblins, of course, are all over all Zelda games, Leavers, Octoroks, the whole thing. Uh, Dark Nuts um, don't really pop up that often as as you go further into the series um and especially as you kind of get down towards like the wind waker twilight princess end of the the whole thing um they sort of start to pop up more as like mini bosses than anything else um so i I think they they definitely get an interesting introduction here as just like a rank and file enemy type um but i think uh as we've said about many other things phil summer's uh depiction of the dark nut in his guide uh makes them look unspeakably badass they so. are they look awesome they, they look, dude no, they look like a boss they look cooler than any in game iteration that i've seen currently kind of like samurai esque yeah i with, like them a lot so i i think they're really cool i have a question for you Lyndon. lay it on me okay so links going around picking up all this stuff and in this game, I think he's got some of the probably largest items he'd have to carry around, including a raft and a ladder. And a ladder. Is he putting these in like a, a Harry Potter, you know, bag of requirement where he just, you know, has infinite space inside? Or are we under the, the impression that he is walking around with a raft tied to his back at all times? I mean, if he's doing that, you'd think he'd have some uh, some back armor, right? Like if he's getting hit from behind, it's not doing as much damage. Yeah, you're hitting my raft, B. <laughs> Come on, bud. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to refer you to this depiction of Link from an early issue of Nintendo Power. Um, hold on one second. Yeah, here here is a very early depiction of Link from Nintendo Power where he is clearly depicted <laughs> walking around with literally all the items in the game on his back and tucked into his clothes. Like, this dude is just straight up, it's more impressive than the army pack that they have to, like, <laughs> jog five miles with an 80-pound pack. So like, you he's need, doing this. You need to post this on your Patreon or whatnot, or, or your Discord. Discord because, it, yeah, it's literally just Link with every item from the game strapped to his back, and he only has one of each arrow, which is a little lame because you know he's gonna be carrying more but i love the fact he's got the flute tucked into his belt <laughs> like well he's get, yeah and here you've got the, like a little journal or like a map or something tucked into his like his shirt collar he's he, like he has to keep his boomerang behind the handle of his shield because like where else are you gonna keep that thing yeah this link is he is loaded for bear it's impressive honestly so he comes in and he's like he you know, goes over to a jail. Here, hold my shit while I fight that. <laughs> while I like, yeah, fight does he boss. just drop this before he fights a boss? And just like, all right, I'm going to put this pack over here and I'm going to come back for it later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's your answer, Mike. It is all, it's all out there. Color me educated. I feel so educated. Matt, do you have a bloopy, or not bloopy trail, do you have wow. a Z targeting for us? Uh, I'm going to go with Manhandala for having the most interesting name in all Zelda games ever and also basically being Audrey number four and just being a wildly outrageously doofy looking boss. Like it's, it's crazy to me that this thing exists. Phil Summers does a great job of making it look actually scary other than uh, rather than just like a four, uh, a four clawed crab. Well, and look at like his drawing has Link like riding one of Manhandle's heads. Which is heads. awesome. Like, that looks so cool. Like I, I want a head cannon that that's how Link does it when he kills it with a sword as he jumps on it like and just runs around to each head and stabs it. Uh, ah, 
What if it was like oh, what if it was like one of those Metroid Dread damage animations? Oh, those were so fun. Yeah, you can like go into a cutscene where you're just like blasting an enemy like in the face with your cannon during a damage phase. I, I also think that that's the way they should should headcanon this. I think I And if you're gonna do the bomb method, you jump on its back in like the you know the little greenery area between the heads and just shove the bomb down in there and then jump off and roll away. Like cut a hole with your sword and j- oh, yeah, throw and the it, bomb down there. Pop off. Link looks away. Yeah, and he's walking away from the explosion. Oh, yeah. Doesn't look back. Not throws on some sunglasses. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> right to me. Sounds like- <laughs> no lies Miami detected. Style. I think this is how that happened. All right. <laughs> it is. It is now canon. I have spoken it into canon. Mike, do you, do you? I have that power. I have the power. <laughs> Mike, do you have a Z targeting for us? Uh, I'll do my Z targeting as the hermit with the the letter or the note. Okay. Because this bro has been sitting up there for who knows how many years, just chilling out with his his note. Like, oh, I'm going to give this to a boy someday. <laughs> <laughs> They're all kind of pervy. Oh, let's be honest. I'm going to eat rats and worms in this cave until a boy comes along for me to give a note to. Ugh. And you know, it's like deteriorating over time in there. So he's got to rewrite it every now and again. Ugh, and he's like, man. this will be the note. This is the one I send off with the boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All the, all the old men in caves are now the per from uh, family guy to me. Mm. Why don't you take this note? You Her- might just need it. Herbert, the pervert. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I need to think long and hard about what's getting edited out of this section. <laughs> I don't know. I need to have like a, I need to really have a moment with myself to determine like what's, what's making the cut here. You better not edit any of that out. It was I gold. don't envy his job. It was gold. <laughs> God. All right. Well, that gets us through Z targeting. Took some real twists and turns um, as this episode has done in a variety of ways. Uh, let's get into part six, which is our final thoughts, where we let Matt wrap up this section of the game in as succinct a way as he can possibly think to do. The Legend of Zelda continues to be just a nostalgic ride of fun and goofiness as we continue through uh, the foothills of Death Mountain. We get a new white sword. We find some new enemies, kill a ferocious Lionel, uh, discover some uh, old men in caves that give us various helpful items. Uh, we have two dungeons in this section of uh, not super high difficulty, but Dungeon 3 poses some challenge with the introduction of some uh, uh, recurring enemies throughout the series in the Dark Nut uh, that are fun to fight and challenging in a lot of new ways. Uh, both bosses in this section are um, interesting to say uh, the most about them. Uh, with uh, Is that the most you can say about them? That's definitely the most I can say about them. With their depictions in the uh, Phil Summers hand-drawn guide being way better than their depiction in the game. Um, all said and done, we walk away from this section with some more powerful items to uh, help us along our quest, and we have enjoyed our time with this game so far in uh, a lot more than we expected and are looking forward to the rest of the game as we expand our exploration capabilities and uh damage output against enemies well done as always matt that brings us to the end of this edition of the sacred realms rundown we will of course be back next week with another installment of the sacred realms rundown to tackle another two dungeons i believe what are the next two i think it's snake and five yeah i think it's (laughs) snake and lizard right I don't have no idea. Yeah, Snake and Lizard. Max Nichols is joining us uh, for those. That, of course, is Maximus Nichols himself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are you not entertained? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's a record number of unique uh, um, references that we've made in a oh, single episode. This has been an abnormally great number of references. Maximus Nichols, first of his name. <laughs> Lord of the- Now you're throwing another. Lord of the Zelda interviews. <laughs> well, I mean, I just want to say we started with Suicide Squad and we ended with Gladiator. So we're trending upward. <laughs> That's uh, accurate. Yeah. <laughs> well, we technically start with Harry Potter, but uh, and, yeah, we, we yeah, took we okay. took a wild ride. Yeah, it was. It was some twists and turns for sure. All right, y'all. Well, this has been a really fun one. I don't know about you guys, but I am about ready to call this a done thing. Sound good to y'all? Let's do it. Let's get out of here. Mike, seriously, thank you so much for uh, showing back up for another episode. We will, of course, catch back up with you later on in the season. Um, If not before, then definitely when it comes time to rank and review this game before moving on to Zelda 2. How's that sound? I'm super excited for it. If you have me back after having to edit this episode. 
Love you. I mean, that is a, that is a in, in fairness, like it was 50% you and 50% the airplanes. So like, <laughs> I mean, Mike and I can split the other 50%. I can control neither of those things. So there we go. All right, y'all. Well, if you enjoyed today's show and you would like a little extra sacred realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash sacred realms pod. And become a patron. If you've got no rupees, it's not a problem. Five-star Apple Podcast reviews are a great free way to support us. More reviews means that more people see our show. It makes us very happy, Hylians. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram, at Sacred Realms Pod, for updates on the podcast and for behind-the-scenes action. Sacred Realms will be back next Wednesday with our thoughts on The Legend of Zelda, Chapter Three. This is three, right? Yeah. Legend of Zelda Chapter 3 covering two more dungeons. We would love for you to play along with us and to share your thoughts on our social channels. The Legend of Zelda can be played in so many places, but most notably it can be played on the Nintendo Entertainment System, on the Nintendo NES Mini, and on the Nintendo Switch online platform, which is where we are playing it. In the meantime, may your hearts be full, may your arrows never miss. We will catch you all next time. Sacred Realms is an independent podcast production, which is produced, edited, and mixed by me, Lyndon Willoughby. Our music comes from Zelda and Chill by Mikkel and is graciously provided to us by Mikkel and Game Chops Records. Zelda and Chill is available to stream on Spotify or to purchase directly from GameChops.com. Finally, our thanks go to Nintendo for creating such exceptional and innovative experiences.